Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. I am King Joram. I reigned eight years. I didn't confine my people to the worship of one God. I showed them all the gods of the lands around us. But how did they repay me? I died young and was unmourned. My son, Ahaziah, succeeded me as king. I'm King Ahaziah. One year, one year I rule until the war they let me to die in battle. They don't even know where I'm buried. I am Athaliah. My husband is dead. My sons are all dead. All of their children are dead. There is no male heir to the throne. Long live the queen. Well, hey, Foundry Church, it is outstanding to be back with you. Uh, Erica and I and our kids are back from our mission trip, and it was an amazing time in Africa. Uh, I kind of had my dumb and don't, dumber moment. I've got worms, but don't worry, I'm taking a dewormer. If you want more information, there's something wrong with you because it's as bad as it sounds, but it's okay. I got worms. I always wanted to say that, and now I can. All right, um, but don't worry, there is medication. I should be fine. Um, welcome. As we get going today, what we're diving into is kind of this... Um, kind of a three-headed monster of the, the lineage of King David in the kings of Judah. And what we're going to look at today is, um, is Jehoram, Ahaziah, and Athaliah. Um, before we do that, I want to I use something to help kind of frame our conversation. And the conversation really has to do with um, things that trouble us. I don't know about you, but... Um, I like a good story. I like telling a good story. I like a suspenseful story. And when my kids were little, uh, specifically it started with you, Josh, um, we, I, I would tell them stories of the Big Bad Wolf. And why stick to the traditional script, right? And, we, and I would tell the story. And I remember very concerned. They'd be nervous. They'd be listening in like, because it's the big bad wolf. And they'd be anxious. But after a little while, they learned that, um, well, the stories of the big bad wolf weren't really as bad as it sounded. I would tell stories of the big bad wolf's really ignorant cousin, Earl. And all the mishaps and, and torments he went through. And I had a goal every night. <laughs> You're laughing right now. Every night I would try to get Josh to get the hiccups. Because when he would laugh, he would, I don't know if it's because you're such a fat baby or what, but he'd be like, ah, 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 and he'd get hiccups and he'd have to drink water. And the kids came to love Earl stories. They love Earl's stories, and if I can get them to get the hiccups, it's amazing. Because Earl went through every form of human, to or not human, wolf torture possible. And it was a bit like Tom and Jerry or the Looney Tunes. It was outstanding. We had a lot of fun, and the idea of the big bad wolf was dismissed with this idea of Earl because they knew the author of the story. They knew me, they knew where I would go with it, and they would always, they ended up being very excited instead of filled with dread. And I think that gives us a framework for today about knowing the author, about understanding that though things seem terrible and awful, and they are, we know the author of the story. We know how things go. We know God's plan as he has revealed it. So we ask the question, what does trust have to do with it? When we lean into today's scripture and the story of these three monarchs, what does trust have to do 
with what's going on? How do we trust the author? I want to walk with you narratively through um, 2 Chronicles 21 through chapter 23 verse 20. It's a pretty good chunk of scripture. It's a large chunk. I'm going to tell it narratively. It's not word for word. It would have been in your devotions this week. And I want you to join me on this trail. I want you to be with me as we journey down the road and get out of this context of wherever you're sitting in a church service and really find yourself out in the hot Middle Eastern sun, hearing the sounds, catching the the emotion of what's going on. It starts like this. King Jehoshaphat was a faithful and good king, and he died and rested with his fathers. But before he died, he put his sons over the fortified cities of Judah. And he put his sons out there, and you can kind of almost picture it like a hedgerow around the center city of Jerusalem where he put his oldest son on the throne. And what we know is this, Jehoram, his oldest son, was made king. And his brothers were almost these, these kind of little city rulers around him. Once Jehoram's rule was firmly established in his father's place, after Jehoshaphat had died, Jehoram put to death all of his brothers. He put them all to the sword. They were all killed. And he secured, secured and consolidated his power. And he ruled for eight years in Jerusalem. He started his reign at 32, and he would rule till he was 40. And in that time, he followed the ways of the kings of Israel, specifically the house of Ahab, that wicked king of the northern uh, north of, his, of the Is, Israeli kingdom, the ten tribes, the husband of Jezebel, this horrible, rebellious house. And so Jehoram was attacked by Edom. Edom rebelled against Jehoram. And he goes out to meet them in battle. And Edom surrounds him. And at night, Jehoram breaks free. He breaks through the, the, the encirclement. And he gets back to Jerusalem. But at the same time, Libna revolts against Jehoram. And it was because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord his God. He had forsaken the God of his father, Jehoshaphat. And he was not faithful. And so we know this, that Jehoram gets a letter from the prophet Elijah. Now, we all know the great prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, these great Old Testament prophets. Elijah sends a letter to the king, and it deals with a few things. It says this, you have followed the ways of the house of Ahab, of the kings of Israel. You have forsaken the path of your father Jehoshaphat. You murdered your own brothers who were better men than you. Can you imagine reading that? You murdered men who were better men than you. And so the Lord says that he will strike your people, Judah. He will strike your sons. He will strike your wives, and everything that is yours will be hit with a heavy blow. You will have a bowel disease, and you will die from it. You will literally die when your bowels come out of you. It sounds as horrible as it must have been. This is the letter he gets from the prophet Elijah. Then God sends the Philistines a raiding party in, and they absolutely decimate and fulfill the prophecy given by Elijah. They decimate all the sons of Jehoram. The only son left to him was Ahaziah, his youngest son. I think it's interesting to note that he put to death all of his brothers, and he suffered the same fate of his own sons. All all his sons except for one were put to death. He ends up contracting this bowel disease, as the prophet Elijah had said. He gets it, and he dies a painful, brutal, suffering death. He is laid to rest in the tombs, but he dies unmourned. Well, it says this way in Scripture, he passed away to no one's regret. Man, I hope that's not on my tombstone. Can you imagine that? He passed away to no one's regret. Regret. He dies of this lingering painful disease and he's buried in Jerusalem but not among the kings. So we see that his life has taken the shape of the prophecy given by Elijah. In chapter 22, we find that Ahaziah 
was 22 years old when he becomes king. He reigns one year. He gets one year on the throne. And he disobeys the, the, the law of God. He follows in his father's footsteps. His mother, Athaliah, so this would have been the wife of, um, of Jehoram, his mom, Athaliah, who would have been of Ahab's house, she causes him to sin and do evil just as evil as the house of Ahab in Israel. You see history repeating itself once again. The house of Ahab would have been his counselors, and Scripture says that this would be his undoing. His undoing would come because the house of Ahab would have counsel and influence over his life. So, another king from the north, a prince of King Ahab, Joram, goes out in battle, and he's wounded. Ahaziah goes to see his friend and confidant who's been injured. But in that time, there is a man who has been anointed by God, raised up by God to put an end to the house of Ahab. It's Jehu, the son of Nimri. And he finds out that Ahaziah is hiding in Samaria. He hunts him down and he kills him, and they don't even know where Ahaziah is buried. His body is never recovered. He dies in this battle of of being sought by by Jehu. And we find ourselves recognizing that this prophecy over the house of um, of Jehoshaphat's son, um, Jehoram, is, is really coming true. Everything's being laid waste. But then when you think things can't get any darker, Grandmama shows up. And this woman puts a twist on evil that it's hard to summarize. Athaliah is a woman so wicked and brutal, you can't quite put your head around it. It says this, when she saw that there was no heir to the throne and there was no one strong enough, powerful enough to hold the kingdom of Judah, she came into power. She came into power, and when she came into power, she destroyed the whole royal family. Do you see this cycle happening again and again? First, with the son, Jehoram. Second, with Ahaziah and all his brothers, you know, suffering and dying. Then Ahaziah. Now, we see the wife of Jehoram doing the very thing he had done to his brothers. She puts to death all of her own heirs. How sick is that? She kills all her own grandbabies to consolidate power, to take the throne for herself. She's the only monarch ever to sit as a female on the throne of Israel. She kills off the whole family. But then there's something that happens that I find fascinating. There's this woman named Jehosheba, and she is married to the priest Jehoiada. Jehosheba is the sister of Athaliah, and she takes little King Joash, but he's not a king yet, he's a baby. And when Athaliah is on her murderous rampage, she takes that little baby and she, she squirrels him away into the temple and hides him. Remember, her husband's the priest. She hides him in the temple, and for six years in the temple, Joash is hidden by Josheba and, or by Josheba and Jehoiada the high priest, and his wife. The, the, so this would have been the sister of Athaliah's hiding this little king. Because Jehoiada believed in the promises of God spoken over the line of David that God would not extinguish the house or the line of David, but a king would always sit on the throne. And he, they take this child and they hide him away for six years. And they hide him from this murderous grandmother. And in chapter 23, we find this. And this is where the the drums of war start to begin to beat. And you can find yourself, if you can picture with me what it would be like in that hot, dry, dusty Jerusalem city. And all of a sudden, sounds begin to happen. Because Jehoiada began to show his strength and his trust in God's promises over the house of David. And he circled around himself the Levitical priests and some of the king's guards. He pulled the old shields out of service in the temple, and he put them on the arms of the priests. He didn't let the third of the priests who came off duty leave. Instead, he armed them and surrounded the young six-year-old king, Joash. 
and he set things up in order. And then they anointed the young king. They blew the trumpets and began to scream and shout and praise God, saying, long live the king. Queen Athaliah hears this noise from up on top on Temple Mount. She hears it from the palace. She comes running up to the hill to see what's going on. Remember, she's been the monarch for six years. She has no idea one of her grandsons lives. And she finds herself staring in the distance at a young man who is standing between the altar and the temple surrounded by armed men. And she screams screams, treason, treason, and tears her robes. At that point, Jehoiada's orders had been given, and she is taken, and she's walked out to the horse gate, and she's put to death. And they take that boy, and they march him down the hill off the mountain of the Lord to the palace. They sit him on the throne. They anoint him king, and they give him a copy of the covenant. When you trust the author, you are able to see bigger than circumstances. And what we want to do today is we want to take a minute and we want to look at trust in the real life scenarios and settings of this story. For, for Jehoram versus Jehoiada, let's just look at those two. Let's look at those two. Jehoram, he is the king, the son of Jehoshaphat, who has brothers who have made a fortified city ring around his throne. And because he didn't trust them, he didn't trust their intentions, he puts them all to death. He consolidates all power back to himself. He makes me think of um, the, the Kim family in North Korea. They consolidate power to their own detriment. He consolidates power, and he makes sure that the people he can trust are still alive, which, by the way, is him. He only trusts himself. He only trusts in himself. Now, let's think of the high priest Jehoiada. The high priest Jehoiada, who, with his wife, Josheba, helped hide away this little king, Joash. Let's think of him. He knew the promises of God. Jehoiada was a priest. He was a faithful servant of God. He knew the promises of God, and he knew this, that God's promises don't fail. Despite circumstances, God's promises don't fail. So, He knows that since God's word is good, he will behave and act in such a way that may seem personally risky to him, but it puts its trust and confidence in the promises of God. So he trusted in God, and he let everything out of his control, and he did what God had promised. He held this child close and hid him away in the most dire times. If the queen had known about this, she would have put her sister and him to death instantly, but she she didn't know. Jehoiada was part of God's plan. A person trusting in God and his promises is far more powerful, influential, and world-changing than the person who consolidates power for themselves. Jehoiada understood what it is to trust the author. Remember when I said that in the beginning about the Earl stories? That my kids didn't, they began to look forward to stories of the big bad wolf because they knew that the author's heart was for them. I didn't want to send them to bed with Grimm's fairy tales dancing in their head. I wanted them to go to bed with pictures of Wile E. Coyote falling off a cliff. So we had fun. They trusted the author. And in the same measure, Jehoiada trusted the author. He trusted that God had a plan and God had spoken his plan to never let the line of David be broken. And so he trusted in God's plan. He trusted he, well, he trusted in God that he was in control. And that's the hardest thing when life seems to spiral out of control. I don't know about you, but when life spirals out of control, I can be a little bit quick to throw up my hand and be like, oh God, where are you? Anybody else? Like, you know, like if, I, if McDonald's doesn't get my order right, and you're like, why? Why me? You know, I wanted six chicken nuggets, not five. And you just fall apart. And then there's major things where you're like, it's hard to trust. It's hard to trust sometimes. But Jehoiada tells us that we need to trust that God is in control and not seek to consolidate our power, our influence, our stability in our own hands because all of this life can be taken in an instant. Our trust is in Jesus Christ. Our trust is in God's plan and his promises. I think of what Pastor Bob talked about. Pastor Bob Woolham, over the past couple weeks, he talked about this thing with Jehoshaphat. Is God for me? Do we trust that God is actually for us? That he is pulling not alongside of us, but he's actually forging a path ahead for us. He's doing the heavy lifting, that God is for us. 
calling us, leading us, empowering us, gifting us for his purposes and glory. The week before, Bob asked a question in his teaching. Will I seek God in these situations or will I solve it myself? Tell me this, did Jehoiada seek God or did he solve it himself? I would say he sought God. He sought God. But there's another element of this that must be embraced and grabbed onto. And I think Doug touched on it really well. Doug Swink did when he talked about us being people who understand that God is either everything or he is nothing. God doesn't want to be part of your life. I say it like this. God doesn't want to be your get out of hell free card in your back pocket. God wants to be everything. He wants your time, your treasure, and your talent. Not because he's greedy, because he has a plan. God has a plan. He's made promises to the world around us that the world would hear and know the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when I look at what Doug said, and, and you know, he says, do we trust if God, that God's in control? And I think Doug's saying, do you trust him enough to go all in, to give everything to God? Let God be everything and let everything else fall away. I love what Bob and Doug taught on that. I hold on to that. That's why I said to you when I, when I said, don't miss church the next couple weeks. They are pastors and teachers in my life who taught this principle and prove it to be true, that God is in control. But it takes a measure of faith and trust. And so how we would word this, I think in the Christian context, in the understanding of today, is we would look at it and we would say things like Romans eight twenty eight, For we know all things... We know that in all things, God works together for good. All of the, I'm saying it wrong. We know that in all things, God works things together for good, for the, for the glory of Jesus Christ and for those who have been called according to his purposes. We know that God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. That means we trust above our circumstances. We trust when it's out of our control. We trust when we don't fully understand. But what if disappointment is a part of having to trust God? It's easy to trust when things go smooth. We have to learn to trust when disappointment is a critical part of the journey. Otherwise, we're just living an easy life that never has any challenges. And a life without challenges is very lazy and unmotivated. Faith compels us to believe, to hope, and to trust in the promise of God that says, and we know that in all things, God works out for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. We know that God will work things out. We just may not like the circumstances in which he has to work through. But do we trust that he's in control? Do we trust when things go really really sideways, when we get worms in an airport with an 11-hour flight ahead of you, and I'm like, I got worms. What do you do with that? And you're like, God, why? Why? Couldn't this go a little better? Couldn't things go well? When things disintegrate around you and every good plan laid by mice and men falls flat on its face and you're left going, God, are you in control? Are you mad at me? What's going on? Can we trust that God is working together all things for good who know and love God and are called according to his purposes? Or will we seize the day, grab onto things, and force our way through? The question for you and I is quite basic. Do we believe that God is in control in spite of our circumstances? Our response answers the question. Our response answers the question. John 16, says it this way. I have told you these things. This is the words of Jesus, and I think these are so fitting in this. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, because in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome this world. What does that say? It means God is in control. No matter the raging chaos of the world around us, God has not lost his grip on his plan and his purpose for your life in this planet and the gospel being sent throughout it. God's plan still holds. You know, I think for us on our mission trip in Africa, which was unbelievable, one of the things we experienced in uh, Kandabwe village was a deep fear a deep fear. Now, these people live in thatched houses, uh, mud huts. It's, it, it's like going back in time. It was unbelievable. Um, and we're sitting there, and we're talking to people. People don't sleep 
there. They're terrified. They're, they're held in fear by witch doctors and, and just constant fear. I, I can't even explain how, how devastating it is to see people live in fear and be held onto and grasped by these fears of, um, of being taken down into the river where the spirits live. And they have bad dreams about these things. They are haunted by evil spirits, by, by any kind of sickness. If they get sick, they think an evil spirit has attached himself to them. They are terrified. They live bound in fear like I can't quite express. And the words of the scripture, greater is he that is in me than he who is in this world, would be the de- declaring moment over and over again for us as we sat in those places and we shared the gospel and we said, no, that claim of darkness over your circumstances isn't true. It isn't true and it doesn't hold. And you bring the light into the situation and we trusted that God would protect them, that God would care for them and we find people gripped by fear but because they had never heard of the victory of Jesus. They had never heard of the victory that Jesus Christ had against sin and death. But we had to remember the truth that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Because I will tell you, there are powerful spiritual forces that inflicted fear and, and I, oh my goodness, every emotion possible. Fear, regret, shame, loss. I mean, you would just, it, it ran the gambit of how we felt. It was overwhelming. And we would have to remind ourselves that Jesus said, In this world, we will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome this world. So we would sit and we would share in faith the victory of Jesus Christ. And I will tell you this, I sat with a little old man who had only heard that Jesus was killed. That's all he ever heard. That was the gospel he was taught, and he was so sad. He was a little old guy. He had like three teeth left, and he would just see, he was sitting in the shade of his little hut, and he just said, I guess I've heard of Jesus, but all I know is he was a good man, and they killed him. And I said, do you know why they killed him? He said, no. And I said, can I tell you the rest of the story? He said, yeah. So I told him how Jesus chose the cross, how Jesus wanted to go so that he wouldn't have to live in fear that Christ's death was not inflicted on him, but it was the wholeness, the whole desire of God to crush him and put on him our sins so that we could be freed from them. And in his death, our sins died. In In his life, we are brought to new life. I shared the gospel with him, and he was this little tired old man who was so sad. And when he heard that, it was like somebody flipped a switch. He came to life. He raised both his hands. He received Jesus Christ. And they would say, thank you. They have this great phrase, Twalumba, Twalumba. And he just sat there clapping his little hand. He's like, ah, Twalumba, Twalumba. The goodness of God that speaks over our circumstances. The goodness of God that says, circumstances don't control us. The goodness of God that says, yes, this world is hard, but he has overcome it. The goodness of God that says he works all things together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. I will hear that old man saying thank you so much over and over. And he wasn't saying it to me or to to the team with us. He was saying it to Jesus Christ. Twalumba maningi. Twalumba maningi. Thank you so much. He was so thankful to God that it was wasn't a pointless death that left people hurting. It was the most purposeful act of God. So when we look at our circumstances, how dare we live the idolatrous lie that somehow Jesus is subservient to the prince and the power of this world. He is not. And since Jesus Christ is not subservient to the prince of the power of the air, to this world, since Jesus Christ bows his knee to no one, Since Jesus Christ is Lord, we know this, that he has equipped and empowered us to be the living embodiment of the gospel. We have to do one thing, though. We have to give up power. We have to open our hands. We cannot be people who seize for ourselves what is not ours. We have to be people who live in submission to God. And one of the submissions, and I love this, is an invitation by the Apostle Paul to be people armed and on the approach for the war that is ours to fight. God has called us into battle. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 
tells us about this. It's the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm with the belt of truth. The belt of truth, which is the gospel, it is the truth of God as revealed in the council of Scripture. We know it to be true. Fasten it around your life. Get the belt of truth around you. It holds everything together. Um, With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith for which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And finally, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Pray in the Spirit, friends, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Take the battle to the battle lines. Be in prayer. Be in prayer for the world around us, for the lives around you. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And make no mistake, John 3.16 made it very clear that all the Lord's people are everyone. He desires that all should come to repentance. So you need to be praying for your most caustic, lame, gritty, horrible co-worker ex-wife, ex-husband, whoever that you can't stand, they're still part of God's desired plan for redemption. Pray for them. Pray for everyone you can, everyone you see. Pray for them. Put on the armor of God and go out and be a living, active agent for God's plan in this world and stop letting what's going on in this world define whether or not God's in control. But here's the reality. Some of us might be a little ticked off at the author. Some of us might be mad at the author of the story. I won't accuse you of it. I'll admit that there have been times in my life where I shook my fist at God. How dare you? And I look back on it with shame and regret. I look back on it and go, oh my goodness, I'm embarrassed. But the reality was in my circumstances, he remembers that I am but dust. He remembers how finite I am and how weak I am, and he knows and has grace for me. But some of us in this room may be mad at the author. Maybe your story hasn't been this beautiful story of joy and redemption and easiness. It has been a tragedy that Romeo and Juliet shed a tear at. Maybe your life has told a story that most people look and say that is like a life of Job. And they have heartache for you. Maybe you're angry at the author. But I will tell you this. Our circumstances do not define the goodness of God. Our circumstances do not define whether or not God's in control. Our circumstances, quite honestly, are the springboard to our revelation of faith to the world around us. How can you be faithful in such circumstances is the question we hear back. How can you still love God when so much has happened? How can you still trust God? Because my circumstances do not define God's faithfulness. My circumstances don't remove my trust in him. Even when it's put to the test, we have to trust in God. And here's one of the great Examples of people who respond differently to the same story. People who had different answers, different answers for the author. Josheba and Athaliah. These two women. These two women who stood on polar opposite ends. They were raised in the same environment, the same murderous homes and royal families that killed off bloodlines, that killed brothers, sons, grandchildren, anyone they could lay their hands on to contain power. They were both raised in the same environment. I don't know when Josheba found out her faith in God, but she clearly chose God over and above control. And she responded to an author who seemed to have write a really dark story with a story of redemption, and her life spoke the goodness of God, because she is the reason the line of David wasn't breached. The line of David held in little King Joash because 
Josheba, who was raised in the same home, household, as Athaliah, who grew up in and around these same circles, she responded differently. She trusted God's plan regardless of her circumstances, regardless of the bloodshed, the loss, the death, all these things. She still responded in trust to God. Josheba chose to trust God. She is the hero. She is the one we should focus on. She is the one who in some measure should be on the throne. She has this joyful heart that says, I don't care what's going on. I care about the one who's put me in this place. She saw God above her circumstances. So today, I want to encourage you to trust. I want to encourage you to trust. But here's what, what it looks like. It's not some passive thing that's like, I trust you, God. It's good to speak it out. But it's also, it's also good. You know, it's like me sitting on the couch and being like, you know what? I think I'm going to be a marathoner right after this next can of Pringles right? That does no good to speak it out and do nothing about it. So here's the reality. If you trust, you will obey. You will obey. If you trust, you'll obey. I mean, just ask one of my kids, how many times did I say in the past month, could you just trust me? Like how many times? Five billion times? Trust me. Trust me. Because there'd be things I'm like, no, stick a little closer, right? They'd be like, oh, come on, Dad. And I'm like, trust me. I wanted to be trusted. I've never been like, hey, check this out. I'm going to take you to a foreign country in a big city and drop you off and see if you make it. No, I never did that. Could you trust me? So if you trust, you'll obey. If you trust in God, you will obey him. You will quit justifying certain sinful patterns in your life, and you will fall into a life of obedience to him. If you trust, you will take what seems to the world crazy risks, but seems to God the only normal thing to do. God's promise holds just like that. The crazy risk of, um, of Josheba, of her taking and hiding away one of the little princes. And somehow God blinded Athaliah to the loss of that little boy not being there. It was a crazy risk, but to her it was the only thing to do. You're, if, you, if you trust God, you will do things that seem wildly unsafe. Enjoy the ride. It's his. He's the author, and he will care for you in it. If you trust him, and I want you to hear this from me today. If you trust him, you will see people come to Jesus. And I want to challenge you as a church. We are not here to be a country club. There are too many unindeed church people walking around without any knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. If you trust him, your life will not only live the gospel, it will preach the gospel. Your mouth will preach the gospel. There need to be people coming to Jesus in this place around your life because you trust God. And in the end, I think God loves miracles. I think all that stuff is good. God counts, heaven counts, one thing, salvation. Jesus Christ came to save people from sin and death. If you trust him, your life will preach that gospel. And you will be leading people to Christ. It's not just my job. It's not missionary's job. By the way, it's yours. So I encourage you today, let the life, let the life of this young woman who married priest Jehoiada, Josheba, let her life define how you respond and trust to God. Bigger than your circumstances. A God over all things, seeking one thing. The glory of Jesus Christ through his church alive and full of his spirit. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the work you're doing in and around us. And we pray, God, that you would challenge us by your Holy Spirit to live faithfully for you. May we not get lost in all the things of this life, but may we get our focus on you and you only. And may we live for the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. His name, his church, may we serve the church and for his mission, that all would come to know him and confess him as Lord and Savior. God, break us out of our complacency and help us to live a life of trust, really living, active trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.